You may have heard about CityWorks Expo. For years now, we've been bringing people together to share big ideas for better places. Expo connects innovators across the community and around the globe through an ongoing series of events, conferences, and social media. And our goal is to inspire and support people like you, the ones who have a passion for making their neighborhoods, communities, and cities better places to live, work, and play. Check us out at cityworksxpo.com to learn more. Become a part of the Expo community and share your story. You never know who you will inspire with your big ideas. Okay, so I'm going to talk about nudging today. Who here knows what nudging is? Okay, awesome. Not that many people. That is, <laughs> that is perfect. Okay. My great-grandfather made his living by driving a small bus around his rural hometown in southern Mexico. One day, while driving his bus around town, he began to feel ill. As the day progressed, his stomach ache got worse and worse and worse. And so he went to the local healer in search of a solution. The local healer in his small town, this is 1930s Mexico, told him he was to go into the woods, catch a wild frog, slice the frog in two, and keep it held against his stomach for four days. Who here thinks this frog remedy cured my grandfather's, great-grandfather's stomach ache? Perfect. Most people don't. We got, a, we got a smart crowd here at Expo 2015. OK. I, t I tell this story because when my great-grandchildren look back on the solutions to today's most pressing problems posed by governments, social enterprises, and nonprofits, I think a lot of the solutions they'll look at, they'll laugh at in the same ways that we laugh at the frog science of my great-grandfather's day. I think this because the solutions posed today are rarely designed in accordance with the fact that human beings are predictably irrational. So what do I mean by this? Let's look at a couple examples. So by now, you should have all filled out your papers that each of you were given. The first question on here is an adaptation from a famous question from the field of psychology. Uh, which we're going to call the Roanoke disease problem. So you all should have read this. It goes, you are mayor of Roanoke. There has been an outbreak of an unusual disease that could kill the 600 people who have been infected by this disease. You only have two choices as mayor, two different public health initiatives. Some of you were given a paper that says red paper at the top, and some of you were given a paper that says blue paper. So for those of you with the red paper, you have the option of Initiative A, which will save 200 lives, or Initiative B, which has a one-third probability of saving everyone and a two-thirds probability of saving no one. Who with the red paper chose Initiative A? OK, who chose Initiative B? It's, it looks like about double of you chose Initiative A, which makes sense along the lines that you don't want to gamble with human lives. You'd rather take the guaranteed outcome of saving 200 lives. So for those of you with paper B, who chose initiative C, where 400 people will die? Uh, it looks like just a couple people. Who chose initiative D? OK, a lot, lot more. So this makes it look like our audience is now risk-seeking. You'd rather take the gamble with life than the sure bet where 400 people will die. This is an example of predictable irrationality because Initiative A and Initiative C are identical, as are Initiative B and Initiative D. The only difference is in the way these initiatives are framed. The people with the red paper, their initiatives were framed in terms of the lives that would be saved, while those with the paper, the blue papers were framed in the terms of lives that would be lost. So the impact of framing is irrational. But it's not just irrational, it's predictably irrational. So I challenge everyone here to think, how can you leverage an understanding of framing to advance your leadership practice? So what I presume a lot of people here are thinking is that 
maybe this is an important question, but this is just a game. We experts wouldn't make this mistake of being so biased to choose one option versus the next based on simple framing. But that's not what we see. And our next example comes from decisions made by parole judges. So a few years ago, some academics looked at the decisions made by Israeli parole judges over 10 months and asked themselves the question, does anything outside of the law, facts, and the type of crime committed help predict whether or not a person is granted parole? Does anyone have a guess of what one of the strongest predictors of whether or not an applicant gets parole is? Anyone, just say it. Louder? Race and ethnicity. Yeah, even one of the best, even a much better predictor than that of whether an applicant got parole was the time of day their application was considered. So a typical day for an Israeli parole judge is interrupted with a morning coffee break and an afternoon lunch break. And we see that applicants, who's at, people whose parole application was considered at the beginning of the day, immediately after morning coffee break, and immediately after the lunch break, receive parole about 65% of the time. But applicants whose parole, people whose applica parole application was considered immediately before lunch break, immediately before morning coffee break, or at the end of the day, were granted parole virtually 0% of the time. Behavioral scientists attribute this to a mental bias called choice overload. Choice overload is a symptom people suffer from in repetitive decision-making tasks, where as time goes on, it becomes easier and easier and easier to go with the default. So in a parole case, the default is to deny parole. The impact of choice overload is irrational, especially in this case, when real lives are at stake and the decisions are being made by experts. Even these experts, when asked, does the time of day influence your decision, all of them said no way. But again, choice overload is not just irrational, it's predictably irrational. So I challenge everyone here to think, how can an understanding of choice overload, how can you use this understanding to advance your leadership practice? So this is a talk about nudging, which is my fav one of my favorite things in the entire world. And what we've seen so far is that mental biases can get the best of us. They can even get the best of experts. But what nudging is about is preventing nudges, not just preventing mental biases from getting the best of us, but finding ways to make these biases work for us. So the next example changed my life. It's my favorite example of nudging, not just because of what this research found, but what a few people did after reading this research. So you all filled out these, uh, answered this question on your sheets of paper. What information would lead you to reduce your energy usage? Who chose sign one? OK. Who chose sign two? OK. Sign three? OK. And sign four? OK. There seemed to be a pretty even distribution. It's hard for me to tell completely with the lights here. But when researchers put signs like these on people's door, they found out that only one of these signs resulted in any amount of behavior change, any amount of energy reduction. And it was sign four. Being exposed to the social norm, when in fact this social norm is true, that most of your neighbors are taking initiatives to reduce their energy consumption, resulted in people reducing their energy consumption by 6%. Which is, which is a tremendous impact compared to other environmental initiatives and, and the low cost of this. And so in 2007, a few people read this research and decided to start a company called Opower. Maybe some of you are familiar with Opower. So what Opower does is they track and analyze energy data and have produced one very simple product a sheet of paper that looks like this. It compares your energy usage, where it says you, to that of your neighbors and that of your efficient neighbors. 
in this one little piece of paper infused with an ultra-powerful nudge has resulted in O-Power saving homeowners like you and me. I don't own a home, I'm 25, but those of you who own homes, um, those of you who own homes has saved $711 million. O-Power has also, this simple sheet of paper has led to the equivalent reduction of energy as are used by all homes in San Jose in one year. And even more, O-Power is now a publicly traded company with a market capitalization of over $450 million. That's the impact of one simple nudge. But again, the impact of social norms is irrational. Most of us, 75% of the audience, said something else would influence them more. And it turns out not only do those other things not influence us more, they don't actually change our behavior at all. And again, the impact of social norms is not just irrational, it's predictably irrational. So I challenge everyone here to think, how can you leverage an understanding of social norms to advance your leadership practice? So our next example is perhaps the most famous example in the entire field of nudging. In 2003, some academics looked at the organ donation rates across Europe. And what they learned were there are two different, you can generalize the organ donation schemes across Europe and across most of the world into two buckets. Bucket one are the countries where there's explicit consent or the localities where there's explicit consent. You need to fill out a form and declare, I desire to be an organ donor. And there's other locations, other countries, where there's presumed consent, where you become an organ donor unless you fill out a piece of paper or a form saying, I would, not, I would prefer to not be an organ donor. And so, the, the preferences for organ donation across all of these countries shown here are virtually identical of when you poll the citizens of who wants to be an organ donor and who doesn't. But there's a difference in the rates based on this little change in the default, whether you live in a country with explicit consent or presumed consent. Does anyone have a guess of what the organ donation rates are in countries with presumed consent? Just yell it out. 80%? In most countries, it's over 99.9%. And the preferences are not any different in these countries. In fact, the countries with presumed consent simply have a policy that better reflects the desires of their citizens. So the United States has some areas with explicit consent in other areas with presumed consent organ donation schemes. And it's estimated that if across the board the United States we had presumed, a presumed consent organ donation scheme, we would save 5,000 lives per year. And those organs would come from people who want to be organ donors but just haven't taken the time to go fill out the form. So again, the impact of defaults is irrational, especially in this case when you can really save a life but it's not just irrational, it's predictably irrational. So we challenge everyone to think, how can you use your understanding of defaults to advance your leadership practice? So our last example is hot off the press. Maybe some of you read this. It was on the cover of the New York Times business page on Thursday. This example says there's, we can generalize there's two types of honesty pledges. Those in a courthouse where you pledge to be honest at first and then you make a statement. Or another type where you fill out a form and at the end you pledge that what you have said was in fact true. If one of these types of honesty pledges led people to be more honest, that again would be irrational. My choice of whether I tell the truth or whether I lie should not be influenced by the, by the sequence of events between this, my statement and my declaration of honesty. But so the article in the New York Times showed that the US government ran an experiment where they sent two types of forms to vendors who owed rebates back to the government. One, f one group of vendors got a form that a traditional form where you filled out the costs of your rebates and had to sign at the bottom. 
another group of vendors got a form where you had to sign at the top and then fill out what you owe back to the government. It turns out in this three-month study, vendors who signed at top reported that they owed the government 6% more in costs, totaling to an increase in government revenue of $1.5 million. The, the impact of a simple nudge, virtually zero costs, switching the location of where people sign on forms. So again, the impact of signing first is irrational. But it's not just irrational, it's predictably irrational. So I challenge everyone here to ask yourself, how can you leverage an understanding of signing first to advance your leadership practice? So I love nudging, but nudging is not perfect. A nudge that may well work well here in Roanoke might be complete frog science down the road in Blacksburg. But the only way we can learn is by running experiments, like the government did with this signing first example. And we can learn what works in what contexts in what doesn't work in other contexts. Further, I completely acknowledge nudging is not the solution. It's not going to fix today's most pressing problems. Nudging won't fix climate change. Nudging won't fix a broken criminal justice system. But what nudging can do, nudging is a low-cost, high-impact way to make a big dent in important problems. And once we make that big dent, we'll have more time and more momentum to dedicate to the really hard to fix aspects of these important problems. And for that reason, I argue, leaders must be nudgers. Here's how you start.